Hi, everybody. This is Tracy Malone from NarcissistAbuseSupport.com. Today, we are going to talk about and talk to the people who are going through a divorce, who have children, and the custody is getting ugly. Custody evaluators can get called in. Something called the GAL, guardian ad litem, could be called in. Custody evaluators uh, and children's attorneys could be pulled into the mess and the confusion that is going to determine their future. Who is going to have custody? What will it look like? And this is where it gets really ugly. This is where you guys can't decide on anything. So the court is appointing people to sit there and interview you and your children to make the decision for you. I hope that you are not in this place, but if you're on this video, you're probably trying to figure this out because somehow you just got assigned a court appointed children's attorney or someone who is going to evaluate your family and your parenting. Today, my guest is Jason Lavoy, and he is a former divorce attorney, now turned divorce coach, and he is a madman of a wealth of information. I just love him to death. So let's welcome Jason and have this really hard to heart talk about custody evaluators, guardian ad litems, um, court appointed advocates and court appointed children's attorneys. Let's go meet Jason. Welcome to my show, Jason. It is so great to see you. Tracy, it's so good to be back and talking with you. I've missed you. I know, it's been like a week or something. <laughs> <laughs> We go eight months and then it's a week. I know, <laughs> right? exactly, exactly. Well, you are the divorce guy, the founder of Divorce You and um, the Divorce Resource Guy. So tell my audience a little bit about yourself and then we'll go into our, our conversation, which I can't wait for. Yeah, awesome. So my name is Jason Lavoy. Again, I'm a former divorce attorney. I live in New Jersey, but I coach people through divorce all over the world. Basically, what I do is I help people overcome adversity by coaching them through the divorce uh, process, empowering them with the information that they need to know um, so they can make the best decisions uh, for their lives. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, I am so excited that you are here today. It's just everyone needs to know you. Go to your website. I was there this morning. Um, we'll talk about divorce you at the end, because I really want people to understand what that is and what the benefit is, because so many people are floundering, looking for help through this process. And, you know, having a divorce you is, is like a, a combined thing that it's affordable and they can get into it and, and learn and grow through the process. So we'll talk about that at the end. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll explain it all. Okay, so today we are going to describe and get the definition because people who are involved in this high conflict divorce of narcissistic abuse, right? There's all these people that call, get called in. We're not talking about the financial people and the forensics and the this and the that. There's all kinds of people that got sucked into this. Today, we're talking a lot about the um, custody evaluators, a GAL, um, a court-appointed special advocate, and a children's attorney. These things put the fear of God into my clients when all of a sudden they're like, oh no, you know, my spouse is asking for this, like my children need their own attorney. And like, what is this? So let's start with custody evaluator. Where does it start in the process? Like when does, does that get sucked into a divorce? Because it's not a normal divorce. Do you get any of these people, right? Well, right. I mean, normal is a relative term when you're talking about a contested divorce, especially when you're dealing with a narcissist. You know, I don't have to tell you that. Um, <laughs> and a lot of these terms that we're going to talk about today, they can overlap with each other. Um, and we're really talking about the same type of people, but mm -hmm. we'll go through them so people understand it maybe a little bit better. Yeah. Um, so when you're dealing with uh, custody, an issue, if custody is an issue in your divorce, you know, you have minor children um, and it's, it's an issue that needs to be, you can't agree on. The court will try at first, most of the time to kind of make suggestions and, you know, the judge may or may not, depending on the, how comfortable the judge is themselves. If it's a brand new family law judge, they probably will be intimidated by it themselves. But if it's an experienced one, they might try to help the parties work through it and see if they can, you know, come to some agreement with custody because, Everything else being equal, most courts will want to see both parents involved somehow in the children's lives. 
Um, and un unless there's really a an abusive situation going on, you know, like a clear sign of abuse, mental or physical, um, courts are inclined to give equal custody or as close to equal as possible, 50-50, so both parents remain involved. Um, when people start making allegations uh, of abuse, that's when things take a, a turn. And then the judge says, you know what? You know, this is above my pay grade. We got to get a, a professional involved. And what they do is they'll, that's where you start talking about custody evaluators mm -hmm. um, and custody evaluations. Um, and so a custody evaluator is somebody most of the time appointed by the court. There's different ways to go about this and we can talk about it. But if the court will appoint a custody evaluator who's supposed to be a neutral third party, kind of like a mediator is in the sense that they're neutral, um, to evaluate the situation and then at the end issue a report um, that the judge will strongly consider. Um, and then from that report, the court would make recommendations and perhaps rulings on custody. Okay, mm -hmm. which which could include, you know, legal and physical custody, who gets who for what amount of time, and then also what the parenting schedule will be too. So you can can you imagine this? A, a judge who's just a stranger in a black robe, um, mm -hmm. deciding how your family is going to be run um involving the children. It's crazy, but when you know two adults can't figure it out for themselves, this is what happens. Mm -hmm. um, so in short, that's what a custody evaluation. Uh, would include a, a custody evaluator who then would interview the children. Um, and this thing takes months, by the way, and is super expensive. Okay. I mean, easily $10,000. Um, yeah. And, and that's probably a low end range. Um, because what's going to happen is you have to go to multiple, multiple meetings, bringing the kids to this custody evaluator's office. Um, and usually this person is, some professional in um, a psychologist or psychiatrist, mostly a psychologist or some background in licensed clinical social worker, you know, and who has hopefully a lot of experience dealing with these types of situations, contested divorces where mm -hmm. the parents can't agree. Um, but then you, ha you have to remember these custody evaluators are people just like you and me. Mm -hmm. They have their own biases, inherent biases, and you just don't know, you know, and what often hap what often happens is they will right off the bat, you know, gravitate towards one parent versus the other. And in their head, you know, everything is seen through that prism. So, you know, you know, if they don't like men or they think, you know, more often than not, the dads are to blame, then the dad's going to be in a bad spot right from Jump Street, even though he didn't do anything and it's not true. And same thing goes for mom if it's a, if it's you know a bias against women for some reason or mom, and so you just don't know. And um, so the person who's evaluating the who, the person who the court appoints is so important. But most times you don't have a choice because the court is appointing them for you. Yeah. Is there a way to suck up to them? Like people are like, what's the best tactic? Should I be coming in with, you know, I'm the victim or here's the list of things that they've done? You know, what's the best strategy when you're having to face this? And I know they're going to interview your children as well, but I'm sure that's age dependent and they're not going to interview a four-year-old. Well, right. And if they do, you have to take that hopefully with a grain of salt, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, um, I have a... I have a seven and a half year old and depending on the moment, she might say she hates me and I'm a terrible person. <laughs> but the next time, you know, I'm the best dad in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a great question. Um, and again, you have to be very careful. This is something I do as a coach. I can help people prepare for like how to talk and deal with a custody evaluator. Um, because like a judge, your credibility is everything. Mm -hmm. And you want to have what I, I refer to as the white glove theory. You've, uh, you and I have probably talked about this in the past, but you know, you want to be able to wear the white gloves and show no mud on you, um, whether it's to any professional, uh, a custody evaluator, a judge, whomever. And so your credibility is number one. And to maintain your credibility is super important. So you need to kind of know, uh, do a little bit for background research about who this person is, right? If the court appoints a custody evaluator, um, you know, Google them, look up their professional resume, see if there's any, anything good or bad that could be helpful for you. Um, and then 
you'll get a, hopefully have a little bit of a sense of what type of person this is, their background. You want to go in there. I always think, and I would always counsel my clients um, when I was practicing as an attorney, you know, I never thought it was a good idea to go in there with a list of negative things that this other person did, whether true or not, and say, here you go, this is everything, you know, and, you know, case closed. I think that can turn off somebody really quick. Um, and then it puts you in that a bad spot too, you know? So, you know, I think you got to go in there as neutral as possible. Mm -hmm. um, be as, I'll, I'll use the word professional, but I don't know if I, that's really what I mean. Be as neutral, I guess, you know, don't go in there um, insulting your ex, you know, whether it's justified or not. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of want this evaluator to put the pieces together themselves, right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing, nobody wants to be told how to, how to think and how to rule judges included, right? It's the same type of approach. You, nobody wants, you want them to figure it out or feel like they figured it out mm -hmm. for themselves. Mm -hmm. And there are things you can do along the way to help them figure it out, you know, give them clues. Um, if they ask you for information, then you volunteer some information. Um, but never just throw it at them, never insult and, um, you know, paint the other person uh, in a negative light, mm -hmm. unless, unless you get the sense that they're inviting that, right, or asking about it, because that can turn them off, um, and then guard them, you know, to not believe you as much, and then um, it could go downhill from there. So I think that's my number one thing, don't go in there guns blazing, mm -hmm. you know, let them because they've been appointed by the court, let them guide you, right? And you'll get a sense from the questions, you're going to meet with them too. And they're going to ask you questions, mm -hmm. you know, about the marriage, about the children. And you have to let the, sit there and listen and get a, get a sense by the questions that they're asking you, mm -hmm. um, kind of what they're thinking, and then answer accordingly. Um, but when you answer, again, never disparaging, I won't say never, but you know, you got to bite your tongue a lot, right? Because <laughs> it, they're looking, they're looking at these things. And, and um, I've seen it more than on more than one occasion, unfortunately, where, you know, one, one parent will go in there with gun blazing, and it totally turns the evaluator off to them. Mm -hmm. And, and they never get them back. And then everything that that person says from that moment on, the evaluator, you know, eh, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and so, you know, if you go in there, you know, if the other side is alleging that you're this terrible parent, you go in there, show them that you're not, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And um, without saying it, you don't mm -hmm. have to, you don't have to rebut everything with words. Your actions speak louder than words. Let them see the type of person you are um, by the way you speak, by the way you talk about your ex, by the way you talk about the children, mm -hmm. right? Your love for the kids, um, your commitment and caring for your children will come through, hopefully, will should come through just through your words and the way you talk about it and the way you present yourself to an evaluate. Mm -hmm. um, a narcissistic type person may start off, you know, they're very good, charming people, right? I mean, uh. Right. That's the thing. So I get it. And they may start off very well, charming this evaluator themselves, mm -hmm. but I can almost guarantee you because these things don't, are not done in two weeks. Mm -hmm. At some point, they're going to slip up. Mm -hmm. And at some point, their story, no matter how charming it is, it's not going to jive with what you're telling them. Mm -hmm. um, but, and that's where, and that's what you want. That's when the evaluator, if they're good, will understand and see through the, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the mask. The mask. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The mask of the narcissist, right? But she's not going to, she's not going to believe you. If you're going in there yelling and, 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 and cursing and disparaging and insulting every chance you get, no, 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 let she'll, she'll understand after she gets to know you and mm -hmm. how you are really as a person. Um, and then, then you have to trust the process at that point. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's really like when they go low, you go high because you know, a narcissist, they'll charm at first, but then to win, they always push and they, they make these false allegations. And if they're sitting there just slinging mud and you come in and you're like, 
I'm concerned about my children, best interest of the child. You know, I want it all to work out and, and you're taking the high road. Um, again, it's not bad for you because they're going to be the slingers of the mud. So as you said in the beginning, the white gloves come in there and throw it all at them. The narcissist will bury themselves ultimately. And what I have found with most of my clients that fear this type of action, um, that if they are, as you said, sort of the, the, you know, the white hats that are going in there, you're still fighting for your kids and you can be honest as they ask, but don't throw the first, you know, mudsling. Don't whip it out there again. Here's the Santa bad boy list. You know, it, it's, it's not to your advantage. Have it, record it, and be ready to give it to them if they actually ask for it. Right. Um, but- and they will. They should. A, a good evaluator will want to know the bad things that have happened, um, right? But let them do it on their time schedule, not yours. Um, if you're you going know- to children's like therapists to get additional support to the case like do they ever a subpoena in records from a child psychologist or anything They're- they can <laughs> they can depending on the, the the situation and the allegations that are being made um mm-hmm. yeah the court should uh, empower an evaluator to get whatever information they deem necessary um to to make a a thorough report um and, and an opinion at the at the end because that's the job that's the the end result of a evaluation or a custody evaluation is that this person is going to give an opinion uh, mm-hmm. to the judge on what they think the custody situation should be mm-hmm. um, in the best interest most of the time of the children, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, in order, so they should have access to whatever information they need or they think is necessary. And they will continue to ask and ask as as they come into it and something else opens up and they'll, they'll, you know, they'll chase down some rabbit trails. That's why it takes so long, right? Is it's not right. one meeting and now let me make a decision. They're, they're coming into your home often, right? And they're seeing where the children sleep and where their toys are and, you know, almost defending sometimes the, 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 um, things, the accusations that your ex might be making, that you're a terrible parent and that your house is a mess and it's dirty and the children shouldn't be there. And that's why they're coming into your home. It it is like a a court appointed evaluator to figure out what is healthy and what isn't healthy. But do they understand these people? I mean, they are social workers, psychologists, psychologists, psychiatrists. Um, do they understand the emotional abuse factor? Because much of that is invisible. We can't like, show it. Well, you hope they do. And, and if they're experienced and the right type of evaluator, they should. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but And these are things that, right, the more that they talk with you, the more they talk with your ex, the more they talk with the children, mm-hmm. the idea is the picture should make sense, mm-hmm. right? <clears throat> Excuse me. And what, you, what ideally you want is you want your ex to say, you know, go in there with guns blazing with the whole list of bad things that you do, right? You're a terrible person. And every chance he gets, he's going to you know, throw you under the bus and, you know, he's trying to win, right? Or she, right. but for, you know, and so you have to, but let them, like, let them, let them play their game um, because there's nothing you can do to change it, number one. Mm-hmm. All you can do is control you. And like I said, you want, after a while, after enough time, uh, especially if the children are a little bit older where they can be interviewed and you know talk about their experiences your story and the children's story are going to mesh Mm -hmm. and your ex's is not right and that takes time to happen but you got to let that play out Mm -hmm. and that's hope that's what you want that's the end result because if your ex is making these allegations against you that they're that are not true and hopefully they're not true um that will become evident over time because there'll be no proof other than his words or her words, right? right. Um, but you will have not only your words, you will have your children's words reinforcing what you say um, and, and everything make, will make sense, right? To this evaluator ideal. That's what you, you want, what you say, what the children say to make sense. Mm-hmm. And then what your ex is saying, well, that 
that just, I don't understand that because other than you saying it, everything I'm seeing, the evaluator is seeing and hearing mm -hmm. isn't driving with that, right? So he's the outlier. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's how you want that to play out. And then hopefully that's reflected in their report and recommendations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, I see. And I, and I heard it at least three times yesterday um, where the narcissistic parent, both male and female, um, start to buy the children. You know, they start to buy their love and, you know, oh, daddy's getting me a new iPhone if I don't say anything bad to this person. <laughs> but that's a great point, uh, Tracy, because, and again, you have to put your trust and hope that this evaluator is, is good. There are, there are unfortunately a lot of not so good evaluators out there who are doing this, but there are some good ones too. And hopefully if you have a good one through their interviews, with the children, right? If they're interviewing um, little Johnny, who's, you know, 14 years old and he has his phone and, he, and he's telling the evaluator in, you know, the evaluators doing the weekly checkup or whatever it is, you know, um, and if it's a comfortable enough situation where the, the child is talking freely, he's going to say all these things as he should um, about what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, but then the evaluator hopefully is picking up these clues. Oh, you know, daddy's got me a new phone. Oh, daddy's taking me on vacation. Um, you know, and then, and those are red flags. You know, if, if enough of them happen in a row, like those are red flags that an evaluator will be like, oh, you know, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. I'm not hearing that from mom. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and why are you getting all these new things pretty so frequently? And, you know, it sounds like, oh, not, yeah, it sounds like a party over here, but right. And a good, a good evaluator will, will see that and understand that something's going on here and then dig deeper. Um, and, uh, and then hopefully un see that this is a, a, a ploy, a common ploy, you know, being used to win favor of a, of a child, right? And then that will backfire on the parent who's doing it. So yeah. you, you have to, that's why you have to kind of, you do have to put some trust in the process. Um, but the worst thing you, you can have is two people, two parents who are doing the same thing, bad things, mm -hmm. um, trying to one up the other parent and win favor of this evaluator. Then what do you do with that if you're the evaluator? Right. Yeah. So that was the custody evaluator. Isn't that very similar to the guardian at light litem, which is what they call a GAL for those of you who might not heard that expression yet. Are they same roles? I mean, it's basically someone appointed to do the same job. Yes, but no. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. I love because... that's why you're here. <laughs> <laughs> so a guardian ad litem is a, is a legal term um, where the court appoints a guardian uh, to, to really, in essence, represent the children. Um, because the children don't have their own attorneys, mm -hmm. uh, but the children's interests need to be protected, mm -hmm. right? So a guardian ad litem is a basically an attorney for the children appointed by the court. Okay. Um, and so in official proceedings, they are always tasked with advocating for the children. Okay. Um, that is their function. That is their only role. Um, where a custody evaluator is a neutral party um, trying to get up as much information as they can, and then they issue a, a report to the court, and then they're done. They're not an advocate for any anybody. Okay. Um, a guardian ad litem is an advocate for the children. Okay, like a children's attorney also called. Right, right. They are, they are appointed to represent the children um, in whatever is going on. And then usually both parents split that cost. Cause again, you're talking about a whole nother lawyer, right? And well, right. Somebody has to pay for this. Exactly. So, I mean, when it gets into the woods like this and it is just so toxic that your children are having advocates and evaluators and all kinds of other like over the top extreme things, um, it gets very costly. Oh yeah. Oh, I know. And so who pays for it? Right. Mm -hmm. um, well, the person who has the financial wherewithal to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, and sometimes you get into situations where neither spouse has the money. Mm -hmm. And then the, you know, what does the court do? The court isn't going to, um, on rare occasions, I suppose they can, they've 
they will appoint an evaluator to do it, you know, for free pro bono, but that's very rare. Mm -hmm. um, and then you, so then if you can't afford it, you go without it mm -hmm. or the court will say, we're not going without it because it's necessary and you both are going to pay for it, whether you have the money or not, you know, um, because this is not for you. This is for the children, you know, it, either agree mm -hmm. and we don't need this. Right. Or, or you're going to pay for it and go to debt. You know, it, what, what do you do? And, um, and they're very expensive and time consuming. And so um, oftentimes if, you know, you had a, a stay at home mom, let's say, mm -hmm. um, and then the, the dad was working and was the primary income earner um, through the divorce, the court may award or tell the father to pay for the evaluation. But then at the end, Might get he'll, yeah, he'll even, it'll come out of somewhere, right? Because he shouldn't be saddled with the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes one parent is saddled with the whole thing, but there has to be a reason for it. Right. Um, so then you're really getting into the weeds of that particular case. Mm -hmm. But yeah, th these things have to be paid for. And when people don't agree, it gets real expensive real fast. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, these kind of decisions are are really kind of, I think, tell me if I'm wrong, are what the custody would look like. We're not getting into, are we getting into the weeds of this Christmas and next Christmas and parenting plans with these people? Or are we primarily going, this is what we recommend for time with each parent? It depends on what the evaluator is tasked with. Okay. Um, there are custody evaluations that are full evaluations that will, yeah, include parenting schedules okay. for the year. Now, this is what I recommend, a week on, a week off, three days with mom, four days with dad, alternating schedules, alternating weekends, what have you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because if if you can't agree on, you know, joint or legal custody, mm -hmm. then you're not, you're not agreeing on who gets junior on Christmas and New Year's, right? Um, <laughs> so all that needs to be dealt with. Otherwise, yeah. you're going to be back with the same... Uh, problems as as before so the idea is to you know get every the, the evaluator will recommend this is what i think is in the best interest of the children and here's the schedule that i recommend mm -hmm. yeah so you just mentioned two things and i'm like writing it down while you said it because i'm like we should talk about that too awesome so <laughs> you know for the people who are really starting out here and i hope this is the people that are going to find this video and and get like some comfort in understanding it because there's so many things that happen there's all these things that have letters and and dates and and you know your affidavits and your this and your that there's so much that happens all at once that you know if you're in this situation and you're, you've got the children there's physical custody and there's legal custody and um you know can you explain the difference for people so that they know like what they are sure um and right because you, there are differences um but they're intertwined so legal custody is who legally um can make certain decisions on behalf of the children and by this, we're talking about like major decisions, whether it's regarding like health or, you know, where they're going to go to school or mental things health. like, yeah, mental health, right? Mental health, but also physical health. You know, if, you know, it could be anything from getting braces to having a, a surgery, um, a COVID shot. <laughs> yes. Right over that. These times. Right. Flu shots, COVID vaccines, all those things, medical, major medical decisions, um, that would fall under the category of legal custody. You know, who can, who can make that decision? Mm -hmm. um, and usually it's 50-50, meaning you need both parents' approval or consent to do it, um, which makes sense. But depending on the situation, one parent might be afforded legal custody because it's so dysfunctional that it just would never work, um, you know, which is unfortunate. And then physical custody is who are the children living with more most of the time? Mm -hmm. So the primary parent who has physical custody, either it's 50-50 and you try to split it up, you know, between the two parents um, yeah. as equally as possible, which mm -hmm. is most common, I would say. Um, or if one parent has physical custody, you know, then the children are living with that parent the majority of the time. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, and then seeing the other parent on a limited basis. Yeah. I know, I know I had a client last week that was attempting and it hasn't been done yet. So we're throwing it out there for people it's when it comes to the decision making. So, you know, like who's going to, you know, again, we're talking braces, we're talking all of those medical decisions, but they were going after specific things that in this case, the mother was going after. I don't want to argue with him over the children's activities. And I don't want to argue about mental health, but other bigger decisions can go to both of us, right? Because it's simply not worth the battle to go, you know, little Johnny wants to go to soccer this year. Well, I don't think I want him to do that, you know, and, and that kind of just not getting along. And so the separation of some of the different components, is that commonly done? Yeah, absolutely. Uh... And you, so you brought up a good point, um, extracurricular activities, mm -hmm. um, right? One parent wants, um, you know, their daughter to go to dance lessons and, and the other parent says, no, I'm not going to pay for that. Mm -hmm. Um, so then what do you do? Right. All that should be spelled out mm -hmm. in whatever final settlement agreement you, you come to, or, um, you know, even if the, if the court has to do it for you, the court should spell it out, um, at nauseum. I mean, and you don't think about this. Normal people, when I say normal people, people who aren't Not going nice. through a contested divorce. <laughs> but um, you know, you, you wouldn't tep you wouldn't come across these issues. But when you're getting divorced and you can't communicate well with each other, if you come to a settlement, right, in an agreement, and then you, that document, which is called a settlement agreement, when I was practicing, it would be it could be easy to fifty to eighty pages long, mm -hmm. and because you spell out, and I, I'm not even at nauseum, <laughs> every little detail as far as you can, um, so there's not a problem, so there's no ambiguity. Um, mm -hmm. Because whatever happens once that court stamps the divorce final and there's a problem, that's the first thing you do is you look into that document and you say, okay, what do we do now? Right. And if it's not spelled out in there mm -hmm. and it's not clear, then you're in a pickle. <laughs> Absolutely. In my book, I have a section called the gray areas of a divorce decree in yes. which narcissists, like, again, we'll go back to that Christmas. You get them this year. I get them next year. That's the normal way. It's, it's in every decree. It's a simple, okay. But it, in a narcissistic divorce, it must be spelled out that Christmas starts at, you know, 9 a.m. on Christmas Eve. You return them by noon on Christmas Day. You know, very, very specific. So I used a case in the book of, and again, sorry, guys, this is not intended for you. It's just the story of what the person had happened was the dad took them that first Christmas and took them Christmas Eve and then wouldn't bring them back till after Christmas break. And so she's calling the police, she's hunting down, she's trying to like, he won't answer my calls, where are my children? And the police officers looked at the decree and said, it doesn't say when he has to bring them back, ma'am. And we can't do anything about it because it says he gets them for Christmas. You right. To put that in. Right. And not just holidays. I mean, uh, picking up from school, um, right, at 4.30, you know, dropping off at 7 a.m., mm -hmm. you know. I mean, like really anything that you can think of, mm -hmm. you, you would put in this uh, agreement. And, you know, because the idea is you want to reduce the amount of ambiguity mm -hmm. as much as possible. You're not going to be able to foresee every situation that's going to come up, but you could foresee a lot. <laughs> if you foresee a lot, you will have less post-divorce abuse. You will have less legal chasing down. Your kid can get braces if they need them, you know, um, and you know, just school decisions and health decisions and vaccine decisions. If you are an anti-vaxxer and you are fighting over that, then that might want to be in there because again, did we know that there would be a COVID vaccine? No. But if you are truly like, I don't vaccinate my kids from all the normal vaccines or religion is another way where this gets pulled in. You know, I will raise them in my house in this religion, but you don't have to. Oh, a decision absolutely. Like that is something that if you don't put it in there, they can come back out at you. Yeah, I guarantee you, since COVID, now there are COVID clauses in, in these divorce agreements. Uh, people didn't even think about it beforehand because why would you? But now, right, when's the next COVID going to happen? And mm -hmm. then what are we going to do? So that's going to be all spelled out. 
Mm -hmm. um, to reduce that ambiguity moving forward in the future. So absolutely, like, and you might think it's ridiculous and it may be ridiculous on some level, but if you're going through a contested divorce, it's not ridiculous and yeah. you've got to do it. And you know what? People get hung up on the cost. Well, my lawyer's like, it's a pain in the neck to put all those times and specific things in there. And I say, pay now or pay later because you will be back in court if you do not have this spelled out. It's just a fact. So this is the best boundary document that you could ever put together. And the most important thing, if you've got children. Right. And if your lawyer presents you with a settlement document that is not this um, detailed or is, you know, like eight pages long, I'm not saying you're, you need to go talk to somebody else, but you may need to go talk to somebody else but like before you sign that. <laughs> yeah. Get an education. Um, yeah. Yeah. You're just going to be put in a bad spot later um, because even the most detailed document, um, if somebody wants to disregard it, they're going to disregard it and you can't stop that. But the process for enforcing it will be a lot easier if, if, if it's detailed enough. Uh, and yes, you may have to go back to court, you may have to file a motion to enforce it, but if it's clear and not ambiguous, the judge will agree, and then you can recoup, hopefully, whatever money you spent enforcing it, um, right? And so that's the idea. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. These are such important parenting decisions and things that intertwine in a high-conflict divorce. Is there anything that we missed? Oh, my God. <laughs> 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 you can talk all day. <laughs> oh, yeah, we can talk about this for weeks. Um, I mean, those are the big, the big things. You know, if, if we're kind of coming full circle, uh, Tracy, to the custody evaluations, I would say one thing that we didn't touch on that usually is an option is that before the court says, I'm appointing an evaluator for the both of you. Mm -hmm. And even when the court does that, most states allow you, of course, every state's different, so you have to check the law in your state, but most states allow you to hire your own evaluator mm. right? in, in addition to, so both parents, if they wanted to, could hire their own child evaluator who's going to do their own evaluation, issue their own report, and then you would have the court evaluator issuing their reports. Now you got three people, right? So that's triple the cost. I'm not saying this is something that you should aspire to do, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, you probably have the right to do it. But then you got three people and your evaluator, your evaluator, your evaluator is going to say one thing. Yeah. <laughs> your ex's evaluator is going to say the opposite because let's just be honest. Right. And, and then you have the court appointed. So at the end of the day, the judge is probably going to listen to the court appointed evaluator anyway, mm -hmm. but um, or another option before the court appoints somebody is that you two can agree on a custody evaluator, mm -hmm. but that really depends again on the level of, right. <laughs> <laughs> and, I were um, so, so there are different ways to skin this cat to, to try to make it less costly. Um, but it takes two to tango and it, we, it always comes back to that. You know, when you're dealing with a, a narcissistic type of person, mm -hmm it's very difficult. And so unfortunately, then you're going to have to go through the, you know, the drudges of, mm -hmm. you know, and the cost of, of fighting it out. But if there's some way you can convince each other that this makes no sense on any level for us to do this or for the children, mm -hmm. um, there are better ways to do it. Right, right. And, and the journey's long, you know, if you are in this kind of contentious thing, hold on, strap yourself in because um, the, the fun is yet to come and, and <laughs> that, not in a happy way. Um, it is, it is, um, I'll use it, I'll say it, it's a shit show. <laughs> it is just something you have to get through, but don't run away from the battle. Whoever's listening to this, understand that even though they're they're not agreeing to things, try to get as much of it in. And, and a lot of times people are forced to go into a mediation before they hit a courtroom, even you know, with a high conflict thing where we've already got a judge that's giving an evaluator, then you're already in the court, but you may have to go in for a mediation. Sometimes that is a good place to nail down like 
when will, who's going to replace the kid's phone and how often will they, the computer, who's going to do that? Like those little details, who's going to pay for the car, the insurance, the, you know, all of those little details as your children age that might be able to be part of the negotiation in the mediation so that when you are dealing with bigger things, like who's going to get them for how long, you still know that this part is approved and this part is settled if you can get that far. Yeah. And let me just piggyback off that for one second. And I know time is tight, but this is, I think, important because when we get caught up in this, um, you know, the emotions are running high, right? And you can't stand your ex and they can't stand you. Um, and you, you small, oftentimes get to the point where it doesn't matter what they say, whatever they say, you're conditioned to put up your defenses and just disagree with it flat out, right? Okay. And this is where somebody like a coach or a, an attorney can, can help or a therapist because if you have the opportunity to agree on little things like you know phones, or you have to take advantage of that. You, you want to you agree on as much things as possible. And just because your ex, who may be an asshole, just because they came up with the idea it doesn't mean it's a bad idea, right? Um, so I guess my point is try to keep an open mind and not fight about every little thing because that's what's going to hold you back from getting this done. And that's what's going to drag it out and make it cost even more is when you fight about everything. Yeah. Sometimes they come up with a good idea mm -hmm. or a fair idea, right? And, and that's what you're looking for. So you, you got try to keep your, you know, you, and that's where somebody who's helping you through this process that's where that value comes in uh, because you're going to get yourself in this emotional uh, whirlwind where you're not going to see it, right? It might be staring you right in front of the, your face, but you may not see it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not your fault. It's just the circumstances. But right, just because they are proposing something doesn't mean you have to disagree with it. Exactly. And, and you know, again, as you said, um, negotiation is the key here. So sometimes giving a little in on what they want, you might be able to, you know, get a little more of what you want. So um, your cooperation will make it easier. I'm not saying give in and throw down the white flag. I'm That's saying not what I'm saying. Yep. No. Negotiate yep. with, with an honest heart. And as you said, be open that just because they said it doesn't mean it's the worst choice. And you could end up with something worse if it gets into the, you know, evaluator and GAL kind of world where they're making the decisions, the judge is choosing these things. So yeah, nail yeah. down as much of these, you know, I call them the mundane little, you know. Details. The low-hanging fruit. I love that. I'm going to use that from now on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, if, you know, uh, living a, a divorced life, is not the same as living a, a life where you're married and under the same roof and everything's combined. It's mm -hmm. different and it may not be what you envisioned mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be a transition. And, and so once you come to grips with that and, and understand that it's not what I thought it was going to be, but I have to make do with what it is, mm -hmm. um, then that I think helps free your mind to think outside the box as far as when you're, when you're, you know, how is this all going to work? Mm -hmm. Right. Because it's going to, you're going to have to be flexible and think about it in a way that perhaps you didn't think about it originally. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been the best conversation. I love talking with you. We've got a lot of good information here. T let's talk about divorce you for a second and, and share with everybody what value that has and how it can help them in the process. So divorce you is basically how I help coach people. Um, and it's comprised of, of two things. I, I coach people one-on-one, -on -one, of course. And if you're interested, you could always contact me about that. Um, and I also have a monthly membership community, which is called Divorce You, the D Divorce You membership community. And that's for people who are looking to be empowered with information about the divorce process. Um, I have a, a, a video divorce course, How to Get Divorced A to Z, which I created from the ground up, which is me narrating videos, walking you through every step of the process. And again, empowering you with all this information that even if you have an attorney, you're not going to get because it would cost you tens of thousands of dollars for them to take the time to give it to you. And mm -hmm. you don't have the money, they don't have the time, and that's why you don't get it. But I think it's information that you need to know um, as you go through this process because it will help you 
when you talk with your attorney, understand what they're saying, uh, understand what questions you need to be thinking about, what documents you need to be getting, everything. So that's one half. And then the second half is monthly group coaching calls with me on Zoom. Um, and you can ask me questions and we help you. I help you work through whatever issues you are currently dealing with. And when you're going through a divorce, like I said, you got to strap yourself in because unfortunately it's probably going to be longer than shorter and you know, new questions are going to happen all the time. So that's why the monthly calls are a great resource for that. Perfect. Perfect. And how can they find you? Just go to my website. That's the best way, jasonlavoy.com. Um, and you can learn more about Divorce You and me. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. You can always email me at jason at jasonlavoy.com. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. He's a resource. He actually wrote for my book. He's one of the experts. I did. And I'm so excited. That's just, I mean, I just love you to death. And I'm so glad that you're here to help everybody through these processes. Oh, thanks, Tracy. I love talking to you. All right. We'll see you soon. Wasn't that great? He's so smart. We could talk all day. And actually, we have talked for hours. I was on his podcast just last week. That's um, why we were like so chummy. We were just together. And he has been one of the contributors to my book, Divorcing Your Narcissist. You can't make this shit up. This is the book that I wrote that is going to change your life. If you are looking at custody, if you are looking at setting together your divorce decree, um, you really want to open this up and look how, let's say I was going to find the page for you, look how to narc proof your divorce decree. They don't see things the way you and I would. So we have to get those details in. And that whole chapter is going to enlighten you on what to do and also I have a clause in there that's called the what if they don't clause. No lawyer knows that name. I made it up, but it's basically a legal clause that you can put in there to protect yourself if they do not comply with the stuff that is above in the decree. Can't do a divorce with a narcissist without some kind of verbiage like that. So get my book if you can. It's available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Kindle, and as of this week, ta-da! audible. So I hope to see you again soon. I hope you subscribe to my channel and thank you for listening. I'll see you next time.